Thank you, Dr. Orofsky. Thank you all for being with us today. Um, I have no disclosures, and I do want to start out by saying I'm, the, I'm privileged and honored to be the only radiologist who's trained specifically in pediatric radiology. And um, just out of curiosity, show of hands from the audience, how many of you here work with children, take care for children in your daily practice? Great. I'm very relieved. It's maybe a little bit more than half because I was afraid that this was mostly, mostly going to be an adult-centered audience. Um, there will be things that you can apply to your adult patients as well, but obviously, as the title says, the focus is on children. So here's a question for you. How often do we see this scenario? Well, at Children's Medical Center, we see this scenario about 45 minutes, every 45 minutes. So there's a huge a population of children that come into our ED with abdominal pain. And specifically for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to talk about the child who has no past medical history, no prior surgical history, just a kid whose belly starts hurting and you don't know what to do about that. Okay, so for the imaging workup, there are several options. The items on the left side of your screen, x-ray, ultrasound, CT scan, and MRI are the ones that I'm going to focus on. The modalities on the right side of the screen are also very useful in working up um, entities that can contribute to abdominal pain, but those are tend to be more specific, targeted um, studies for uh, patients with a specific conditions that I'm not going to focus on today. So it's very helpful when you are working up a child with abdominal pain to think about the location of the pain. And obviously, you're going to um, also consider other factors, associated symptoms and signs. But um, using this anatomic approach is very helpful. And I do want to say I do appreciate Dr. Fetzer's talk, Old Dog, New Tricks. I'm, my talk could also be called Old Dog, Old Tricks, because um, a lot of this is pretty standard, um, but just as a good reminder. So. Um, when you separate the abdomen into quadrants, the right upper quadrant, we will evaluate the gallbladder, the common bile duct, and the right kidney, as well as the liver. And so entities such as cholelithiasis, acute cholecystitis, and hydronephrosis. In the left upper quadrant, again, we have the left kidney. And the image that I'm showing is a kidney that has a large staghorn calculi. So if there is an obstruction um, to the collecting system or if there are si significant stones in the kidneys, ultrasound is a very good screening tool to evaluate for that. Working around the clock in the left lower quadrant, as uh, Dr. Bailey discussed earlier this morning, is, is an example of an ovarian cyst. So there's a left ovary with a few tiny follicles and a five centimeter cyst associated with the left ovary. And just to um, repeat what she said this morning, um, in the adult population, transvaginal ultrasound is performed. Just so you know, for your pediatric patients, we do not perform transvaginal ultrasounds in our, in, in our, in our patients, in our girls. Um, and then in the right lower quadrant, I'm gonna give you all just a second to look at the image, and maybe in your mind, uh, come up with what you think the diagnosis might be. I showed this to a couple of uh, friends who are not imagers, and the, the knee-jerk reaction is appendicitis. Well, in this case, no, this is not appendicitis, but other entity in the right lower quadrant that we'll consider is iliocolic intussusception. So this is an entity where the small bowel essentially telescopes into the colon. And um, these are two images. The one on the right is similar to the the image I showed on the slide previously where it's a transverse section. The green outlines the small bowel that has telescoped into the red structure, which is the colon. And the image on the left shows that in a longitudinal plane. The risk of this is that um, with, uh, with time, ischemia and necrosis can develop, the bowel can perforate, and the child may have to have some of that section of bowel uh, removed. And so um, patients will present with crampy, abdominal pain, and a lot of these kids are either infants or toddlers and not really able to explain what's going on. Um, there may be some vomiting associated, and in a more severe case, the classic current jelly stool is what's described, basically some um, hemorrhage of, uh, that is passed through the colon. Okay. Okay. The way we treat this, also in radiology um, as a first-line um, therapy, is by using an air contrast enema or air enema. So we put a rectal tube into the rectum. We secure it with tape to develop a really nice air seal because the idea is to pump. We physically manually pump air into the rectum and retrograde and it'll go through the colon and 
push out the small bowel that's been telescoped into the colon. So the first image on the left, you can see that there's gas in the distal colon, and as we pump more air, we encounter the intussus septum, or that segment of small bowel that has telescoped into the colon. And with continued um, administration of air, the intussus septum is gone, and now we see some air in the distal small bowel, so we see reflux of gas through the ileocecal valve, and then we know that we have fully reduced our intussus septum. Okay. This perhaps is what a lot of you are thinking when I mention right lower quadrant pain. Um, it's a very good thought. It's a very common entity. We perform about 1,000 appendectomies per year at our institution, and this is an image of the appendix. And David talked about this also in his talk where you can apply pressure to a structure. And uh, in our case, what we do is manually apply pressure and see if we can make this structure compress. So this is what this indicates with compression. And if the appendix measures a centimeter and you're pushing on it and it doesn't squish down to a smaller diameter, that's one of the signs for acute appendicitis. Several years ago at our institution, we noticed that there was a high variability of practice in how appendicitis, suspected appendicitis was worked up. So some patients got x-rays, some patients got ultrasounds, some patients got CTs, some patients got nothing, some patients got surgical consult, and we said, there's a better way. And so we formed a multidisciplinary team, uh, myself as a pediatric represent a radiology representative, but also emergency medicine and pediatric surgery representatives. And this is the flow chart, and I'm going to kind of break this down into more digestible pieces. So how do you even get on that flow chart or get on that, on that pathway um, for a kid who's suspected of having appendicitis? Well, obviously the initial step or entry into the pathway is going to be based on your clinical assessment. So there's a pediatric appendicitis score which was developed by Samuel and it's been very well validated within the literature to be um, a good clinical decision tool for likelihood of appendicitis. You can see the different entities listed, signs, symptoms, and also laboratory values. Most of them are um, designated a point value of one, but there are also a couple features which uh, designated a point value of two. So the score can range anywhere from zero to 10. Many times we don't have blood work on the patients, and so a lot of times an eight, eight is gonna be a maximum that we'll see when they come through the ED, but sometimes we do get patients that are referred from outside centers who have blood work, and it's still uh, inconclusive based on just clinical exam whether the patient has appendicitis. So um, oftentimes I'll hear that concern, well, we don't have blood work, does this apply? Well, yes it does, and you'll see why. So once you um, calculate the PAS, the, it, it's broken down into three groups. One through three is a low likelihood of appendicitis. Four through seven is a moderate likelihood of appendicitis. And eight through 10 is a high likelihood of appendicitis. The low likelihood is easy. They only have a couple things that may, you know, can be seen with acute appendicitis, but a lot of the features are not there, and in most cases, it's not going to be appendicitis. So um, the recommendation is to explore other diagnoses, um, pursue that, and see, you know, if if you can come up with a different diagnosis and reassess. Okay. The eight through ten in theory is also very simple because many pediatric surgeons are very comfortable diagnosing appendicitis clinically and as many of you know we used to not image a lot of these patients and and just based on the history and physical a diagnosis was made and the patient was taken to the OR so that is the recommendation for those uh, with a score of 8 through 10 because there's going to be a high likelihood of appendicitis it's that middle group that becomes a, a little bit more challenging, right? What do we do? I mean, some signs really seem like they might be, but then others not so much. And so um, the recommendation here is for imaging. Now, there are two options for imaging that we start with. One is ultrasound and one is CT. So how do we decide which way to go? Well, there are two factors about the patient that are, are really going to dictate that that uh, decision. It's the patient's age and size. So in adults, the recommendation is BMI cut off, cut off of 25. If an adult has a BMI greater than 25, an ultrasound is oftentimes not going to be diagnostic just because of the technical factors in a, in a larger size patient. Well, we've uh, looked at our practices and came up with a BMI of 30, and that was done by consensus because there really isn't great um, information, great data on patient 
uh, on BMI cutoff in the pediatric patient. And there are a lot of variables, obviously. We use four age percentiles of BMI in kids, and it makes it a little bit more challenging to come up with strict criteria. So our team came up with a BMI cutoff of 30 to be conservative, because we wanted to, to start with ultrasound whenever possible. The other consideration is whether you're worried that this patient may have perforated their appendix and therefore possibly developed an abscess. And so in that situation also, a CT is recommended because if the patient does have an abscess, they may not be a candidate for appendectomy. Rather, um, image-guided uh, drainage of that abscess may be the preferred route. And so that's something that the interventionalists are gonna to wanna to know exactly where the abscess is and uh, the size of the abscess. So CT is gonna show that very well in order to plan for that potential procedure. Um, I do wanna talk about some of the limitations of ultrasound. So in all the other situations, Ultrasound is the first line tool. It's not a perfect tool, and there, there are some reasons why, and again, Dr. Fetzer did talk, touch base on some of these, but it's very operator dependent. Um, the skill of the ultrasound technologist really plays into how well a study is gonna be um, diagnostic or how reliable the images are gonna be, and, and so how confident I can be in my interpretation. And of course, the more training and the more experience you gain, the better the, the quality of the images and the quality of the interpretation. So other factors are patient-related, as I mentioned, patient size, but also the appendix, there's lots of bowel next to the appendix, and sometimes there's gas, sometimes there's stool, and the ultrasound beam cannot penetrate through those structures. And so if the appendix is retrocecal, it might be impossible to identify. Also, uh, requires patient cooperation. So as I mentioned, I am physically pressing on the patient to see if I can squeeze down that appendix to a normal diameter. And if patient is guarding and has you know, severe pain and cramping and they can't lay still, it's not pleasant. And so sometimes because of the patient's condition, we are not able to do an adequate examination to fully evaluate. Once you have your results, if it's you know, definitively negative, definitively a positive for appendicitis, you're good. Um, in the case of an ultrasound, in our institution, if we don't see the appendix, we don't say that it's negative. Some places do do that. Um, so we just say in our report, we don't see the appendix and we don't see signs of inflammation and they need to, the, the ED physician or the surgeon needs to kind of take in the whole clinical picture and decide what to do next. And so that's why if the ultrasound is equivocal, we recommend surgery consult rather than just going to CT automatically as part of the pathway. Okay. This is just um, a quick slide to show you. There are lots of studies that uh, have been done to look at the um, accuracy of, append of ultrasound for diagnosing appendicitis. And there's a pretty big range, and you have to look into the detail of the met methods of how the study was done. Because like I said, sometimes um, some studies will eliminate the cases where the appendix was not seen. Sometimes they'll call it normal. Sometimes they'll call it equivocal. And so just when you look at the literature, know that there's some variability um, in the way that the results are reported. However, in general, in a, it's a very good study in experienced hands. Here's an example, two examples of an appendix seen by ultrasound. The image on the left shows a dilated appendix measuring about one centimeter in diameter. And this structure here, this curvilinear white structure, is the appendicolith that's causing obstruction to the lumen. And there's periappendiceal inflammation. So this is a slam dunk definitive acute appendicitis. The image on the right also shows the appendix as a blind ending structure, but in this case measuring four millimeters in diameter, which is normal. So the cause of the patient's pain is not because of acute appendicitis. This is a CT scan just to show, historically, CT scan has been the imaging gold standard for diagnosing appendicitis, and you can see why. It's, I mean, it shows it can show the appendicolith within the appendiceal lumen, which is this structure here, and the inflammation and fluid around the appendix. Okay. And, um, an imaging modality that's been used more recently is MRI. This also shows very exquisitely um, and clearly features of appendicitis. This, this is the appendicolith within a tubular fluid-filled structure, and you can see some free fluid adjacent to it. Here's a, an example on the coronal view with the appendicolith and a tubular dilated fluid-filled structure, also diagnostic of acute appendicitis. 
This is data from a meta-study that was done to perform um, meta-analysis to compare ultrasound CT and MRI. The take-home point is that they're all very good. And this is just a slide to show that reimbursement rates for ultrasound CT and MRI. The take-home point is that the ultrasound is the least expensive, and CT and MRI could be two, three, or more times the cost of an ultrasound. So this is a summary slide which just compares the pros and cons of each of the modalities. Um, I talked about a lot of these already, so I'm not going to go through each one in detail. One thing I do want to highlight, however, is that CT scan requires an IV line. And for kids, that can be difficult, especially if they're um, dehydrated, if they're nervous, which many of them are. Just the very act of getting an IV line can, can cause a great deal of anxiety to the patient. MRI is, as I mentioned, a great study. However, it's not always available in the middle of the night, and so that's something to bear in mind. And same thing with ultrasound. In terms of the availability, again, it's going to depend on the tech and the tech experience. So my take on points, ultrasound is an excellent tool for targeted investigation of the source of abdominal pain in children. It is diagnostic for ileocolic intussusception, and it is the best first-line test for suspected acute appendicitis in children, although CT and MRI are also excellent options. And you can evaluate the structural and vascular integrity of these solid organs. So this is my division, my colleagues. Um, please feel free to call us. We're a very friendly, happy group, and we'd be very um, honored to answer any questions that you have. Thank you.